Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight, Bill Breel and I will be doing our third and final part of the analysis of the Renlund's devotional about doubt and faith, which they gave from BYU, Hawaii. Good morning, Bill. How are you doing? I am doing excellent, my friend. Just glad to be here and wrap this up. This this went long, and I think what we said was important, but man, it's amazing how much sometimes you have to say about this stuff, and we've said it before, but apologize to the audience that's gone so long. We hope you're enjoying this. Yes, and we also talked about maybe taking some of the quotes and not doing the whole talk, but looking at the quotes that we found of interest. And then we thought, well, wait a second. If we're going to be critical of the Renlands, then we at least owe them the honor and the respect of allowing them to have their say so that they can be fully and fairly represented and also so that you and I are not subject to being criticized for taking any of their quotes out of context. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited to... to get into this last little section where they kind of close off finishing with their testimonies and giving a personal story and uh, sharing what our thoughts on those. Yes, there are still some very important things that they have to say and important things in the sense of comments to make about what they have to say, I think. There are some quotes that they will make from the scriptures as well as from Elder Widso, which are somewhat long and dry in my opinion. But we're going to go ahead and give them the, the respect of giving them their full say before we make any comments about what they have to say. So you ready to play the tape, Bill? Let's do it. To have questions about the church and its doctrine is normal and the root of gospel learning. Joseph Smith understood that when he read, If any of you lack wisdom, let, he ask, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But the passage continues, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. In other words, ask God, not doubting that he can give you an answer. The passage continues, for he that wavereth, or doubts, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. To receive the kind of answer that Joseph Smith sought, to receive the kind of answer we crave, we need to approach God with a believing heart and a mind desiring that the things of God will become known to us. We love a statement made by Elder John A. Witso, an apostle earlier in this dispensation, that further explains doubt. And I'll paraphrase what he said. Doubt, unless changed into inquiry from a reliable, trustworthy sources, has no value or worth. A stagnant doubter, one content with himself, unwilling to make the appropriate effort to pay the price of divine discovery, inevitably reaches unbelief and darkness. His doubts grow like poisonous mushrooms in the dim shadows of his mental and spiritual chambers. At last, blind like the mole in his burrow, he usually substitutes ridicule for reason, indolence for labor, labor, and becomes a lazy scholar. Doubt is not wrong unless it becomes an end in and of itself. That doubt which feeds and grows upon itself and breeds more doubt is evil. Elder Witso's words are still true. Stagnant doubt does not lead to knowing the reality of the Savior Jesus Christ and His atonement. It doesn't lead to knowing that we have a kind, loving Heavenly Father who instituted the great plan of salvation. We can come to know the truthfulness of this latter-day work, but it requires that we choose faith, not doubt, and that we go to reliable, trustworthy sources for our answers. Alma spoke about this principle as well. He said, And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it's given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word, until they know nothing concerning its mysteries. And then they are taken captive by the devil 
and led by his will down to destruction. Thanks. I think that you did a good job in part two of talking about the Joseph Smith story in terms of doubt. Sister Renlin is using it in terms of having a question and how Joseph Smith illustrates how having questions is the basis of the LDS church. But as you said, Joseph Smith, at the same time he was having questions, was also having doubts. And the doubts were that any of the other churches were actually true. And therefore, because of his doubt, he went to the grove to pray to ask which of them was true. So as I sat and listened to that section, uh, a couple things come to mind. Right away, I'm drawn to this biblical scripture of the the man who has uh, his child who's in some type of seizure. And the people see it as being some type of possession. And he asked Jesus to... Uh, release the demons from his son. And uh, Jesus says, dost thou believe? And the man answers, yes. And then there's this pause. And we use this scripture all the time. The man pauses and eventually looks Jesus in the eyes and says, but help thou my unbelief. And so there's this idea that in all of us is doubt and faith working together. They want. There's this binary way that Elder Runland and... Uh, Elder Cook and Elder Oaks and all of these guys, the way they want to paint it is this black and white. You either have faith, you either have doubt. Uh, President Monson years ago said if, if faith was present, then doubt could not. If doubt was present, faith could not be present. Uh, those things aren't true. Those things aren't, that's not accurate. It's not a, it's not a viable way to discuss this. And all you have to do is look at Peter in the new Testament. Look at this man who's asking his daughter to be healed. Look at Thomas when the res- the savior is resurrected. Um, there's this idea that there's, uh, it's binary and it's not within all of us is this struggle. And, uh, it feels like the church is trying to shield itself off from the ways in which people discuss things that draw attention to the things not adding up. And I think separating faith and doubt and painting one is bad and the other one is good without recognizing they're both present and they're both tools, uh, I think does that. Right. And in this context, I sometimes think of the quote that's attributed to Buddha, doubt everything. Find your own light. Yeah, Buddha should be doubted all over the place. And, and there's lots of, um, uh, what's the word? There's lots of variations of that in this idea of doubting Buddha. Um, there's other things too. Questions good, doubts bad. We kind of hit on that. Double-minded. The idea that the one is double-minded, one is doubting at the same time one is having faith. I just think that's reality when you know the issues. I think Patrick Mason has doubts and faith. I think Terrell Givens has doubts and faith. Uh, I've talked to Marlon Jensen. I think he has doubts and faith. I don't think he's void of those. Um, There's this John Widstow quote, and man, I don't want to read the whole thing, RFM, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to link this in the episode notes, and I would suggest every listener go read this quote. Uh, There, It's long, but there's lots of pieces and parts that Elder Renland is ignoring in his reading. And when you understand it in full, I think the most important thing that I came to is that doubt as an end is is bad. And I agree with uh, Brother Widstow on that, that if, our, if we're going to arrive at the end and still be doubting and not make any decisions and think about it in your life, like you're, you're stuck between marrying Jane and marrying Betty and you just never marry either one of them because you're just not sure which one's the best one for you. Uh, you're, you're thinking about taking a job as an engineer uh, with one company or maybe with another, and you end up just being unemployed because you're stuck not knowing which job is better. I I think doubt as an ends is certainly not healthy. But I think people, when they go into a faith crisis, when they're deconstructing, it sometimes takes, at the minimum, weeks and months. And for many, it takes years and sometimes even decades to deconstruct all of this enough that they can walk away knowing that they've done their due diligence and this thing is not what it's claimed to be. And I think on on some level, we can debate whether decades is too long and whether weeks is too short. But I think there is a certain amount of time needed to sit in this dark night of the soul and wrestle with this stuff 
so that you can come out again, having done your due diligence and feeling like you had the time and resources to process things. Yes, I agree. And can I just read you one of my favorite quotes also from Frederick Nietzsche regarding this very, very idea that the church is promoting here, that doubt is sinful, doubt is wrong, because he actually addresses it in the broader context of Christianity, and he does a beautiful job of it. He even uses it in terms of swimming in the ocean, sort of like this original parable about the kid in the boat. Here's what he says regarding doubt is sin. Christianity has done its utmost to close the circle and declared even doubt to be sin. One is supposed to be cast into belief without reason, by a miracle, and from then on to swim in it, as in the brightest and least ambiguous of elements. Isn't that what's being promoted here? That's what I hear being promoted here. But Nietzsche goes on, even a glance towards land, remember we're swimming in belief, even a glance towards land, even the thought that one perhaps exists for something else as well as swimming, even the slightest impulse of our amphibious nature is sin. And there I hear him saying amphibious nature as we're made for swimming as well as for being on land, right? Even the slightest impulse of our amphibious nature is sin. And notice that all this means that the foundation of belief and all reflection on its origin is likewise excluded as sinful. I'm going to repeat that sentence again. It's very important. And notice that all this means that the foundation of belief and all reflection on its origin is likewise excluded as sinful. That's exactly the message I hear here. Nietzsche concludes, what is wanted by Christianity and here by the LDS Church, what is wanted are blindness and intoxication and an eternal song over the waves in which reason has drowned. End of quote. What is wanted? <laughs> <laughs> Adam having proven himself faithful. <laughs> yes. Um, as you were reading that RFM, I'm thinking about like all the other places in my life where doubt is a healthy thing to have. So any time in my life, so I work in a pawn shop. I'm a pawn broker. I manage a pawn store in Hurricane, Utah. And my job is to doubt every customer who comes in, not to have faith in them. My job works out better. I'm more successful at my job if I take with a grain of salt what people say or when I ask them, you know, are you going to come back and get this item or do you just want to sell it? Uh, about 25% of the people don't come back for their things. Of that 25%, about uh, probably 70% of those folks, um, they have no intention of coming back for their things. And in a business where you're loaning out money, you want to loan out as little as possible on things people will not come back for, and you want to loan out as much as possible on things people do come back for. When I look at uh, a family life, if you suspect, for instance, that your wife is having an affair, if you suspect that uh, an employee is trying to double cross you, if you suspect that um, somebody's lying to you, like doubt is a healthy thing to have in your life. Now, you don't want to live in that space all the time, but nobody does, but very few people do. Most of us have a healthy balance of having faith in people and things that we've learned to trust in. We have doubts about things that we should. So when I, when I take my wife uh, out to dinner and we exit the restaurant and we're going through a dark alley and I hear footsteps behind me, there are some doubts. I'm not trusting everything. I'm, I'm doubting that I'm as safe as I always am. I'm doubting the fact that just because I came out of things every other time, that doesn't mean I'm going to come out of it this time. And so we put ourselves on guard and we put ourselves in defense mode in case something bad happens. And sometimes something bad happens. I, I just think, as you pointed out in your, in your talking there about Nietzsche, the idea that to make doubt bad is contrary to the purpose that doubt serves every day in our lives. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Doubt is a part of human nature. And when you're talking about faith and doubt, faith really is a belief and a trust in somebody else. 
That's really what faith is. Do we have faith in Jesus Christ? Well, if you elaborate, that means do we have trust in him, that he is the son of God and that he will save us from our sins, that he will resurrect us at the last day? Do we have confidence in him? That's really the root element of faith. Doesn't that mean too, though, that you also have doubt in uh, Krishna? Well, yes, you can't have faith in one thing without having doubt in something else. I agree with you. And so, but this whole th- idea about faith and the way it plays out in Mormonism with a real life example has to do with Paul H. Dunn. Now, I had faith in him as I listened to him when I was much younger and listened to his audio tapes about his World War II stories and found them very spiritually uplifting. And I felt the spirit when he was talking to me about those stories because I had faith in him that what he was saying was true. And then much later, when I find out that actually what he was saying was not true, I lost faith in Paul H. Dunn. And unfortunately, I also at the same time had to lose some faith in the ability of the Holy Ghost to witness truth to me. Yeah. And then she finishes off here with this idea of being taken captive by the devil. Again, when we use that type of rhetoric, we're painting the doubter, the critic, the person who has distanced themselves from the church. We're painting them as broken, fallen, tears and chafe, apostate, deceived by the devil, lost the spirit. All of these labels are in our milieu uh, in Mormonism. And every one of us was raised in Sunday school classes that associates those labels to uh, somebody who's, who's now being spoken of as being led captive by the devil. And so I think all these words come with a lot of baggage, and I think we've got to get away from painting people who, in the search for truth, discovered that their religious system didn't add up, in in a courageous act, deconstructed that religious system and stepped away at the risk of losing relationships. Yes, and when I hear this talk and the other kinds of talks that are being given more and more recently— about doubt and faith. Elder Uchtdorf's general conference talk really begins to stick out more and more as an anomaly in which he said that there are good reasons that people have for leaving the church. That was an island of sanity in a sea of craziness. And this talk by the Rinlands continues the sea of craziness because they don't make any room for any good reason or legitimate reason to leave the church. If you leave the church, it's because you're being dragged down to hell by the devil, which also, by the way, serves as a warning to the audience that they don't want to fall into Satan's hands and start doubting and leave the church. Yeah, and we're about to get into the next quote here where they talk about being spiritually bankrupt. And so this idea, I just want to like say this to the listeners we get into this, This idea that everybody who leaves Mormonism is spiritually bankrupt or just because you see somebody on Facebook being critical of Mormonism has nothing to do with what they're doing in their private life. So I know lots of people judge me. They'll they'll come on and say, Bill, like you waste so much time. You must be so miserable. You must be so unhappy. No, like I have I have spiritual practices in my life. I have spiritual conversations with other human beings who also have spiritual practices in their life. Like my life is full of spirituality. My, but what happened is I stepped away from one particular religious system and insiders to that system want to paint those who step away, who distance themselves as becoming or having become spiritually bankrupt. And I think all of us need to step back and go, that's unhealthy language. We ought to honor the stories of another, and we ought to let people describe their own journeys and and allow us to hear them tell us that their lives are still full of spirituality. And for maybe some people, they're not, and maybe that doesn't matter to them, but I think it's it's wrong to assume that anybody who leaves the this one particular religious system somehow no longer has any spirituality in their life. Right. And from the outside, the LDS perspective, what you're saying makes absolute sense. But from within the LDS perspective, what you are describing has to be not believed. It has to be recast, reformulated in some way. And usually the way is this. First off, you're lying. You're not really happy outside. You're just saying that in order to make us think that you are when you're really not. 
or a distinction, another distinction, like between doubt and questions, right? Another distinction is drawn between joy and happiness. And you've heard this within the LDS church. Well, you may be happy, but that's just a brief, a brief temporary thing. It's only in the Mormon church that you can actually have true joy. You've heard that, haven't you, Bill? I have, and but strangely enough, all Latter-day Saints seemed so excited to have church go from three hours to two. So my question would be, it, if you feel more joy now with two hours than three, uh, then maybe ask yourself if you'd even feel more joy with one, um, right? Like there's this idea that to say like, oh, I'm so happy at church. Church so fulfills me. I got so much joy. Well, maybe, but on some level, church also burns us out. People are saying no to callings in uh, much greater numbers today than say a decade ago. Uh, leaders often feel like they are exhausted. Uh, families feel like they often don't have the fathers in the home because the fathers are out doing their callings. Um, and often with mothers as well as they're carrying out their responsibilities. I just think it's a mixed bag. And it's not fair to say like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're really happy inside here because I've seen a lot of Latter-day Saints who aren't that happy uh, and they might put the face on for Sunday for three hours. But if you have a, a, as you have a conversation with them and you get into what their life looks like, uh, I would say there's also a lack of joy in a lot of homes of Latter-day Saints. Right. Hey, I've got to just tell you this one little story. OK, this is a number of years ago. And I've got this foreign exchange student from China, from mainland China who is going to high school and he wants to do absolutely everything he can possibly do in America. He's just a great kid. He's probably 18 years old and he also wants to go to church, right? So yeah, I take him to church. He's sitting there the very first day he's in church. It was the first Sunday in September, the school year, whatever it was that, um, what year that was. And there's of course, fast and testimony meeting. So he's sitting next to me. We have a typical Mormon fast and testimony meeting. And everybody who's been to one knows basically what I'm talking about. So of course, it doesn't register to me that this is anything unusual or remarkable. But after it's over, the Chinese foreign exchange student looks to me and he says, why is everybody so sad? <laughs> and I just, and I just started laughing out loud because yes, there are people up there, they're bearing their testimony, they're crying, they're talking about all the hardships they're going through, all this stuff. And so this is this is this Chinese foreign exchange student's first experience, not only with Christianity, but with the LDS church specifically. And after the very first meeting, which is a, just a very normal type of LDS fast and testimony meeting, his first reaction is, why is everybody so sad? And that really helped open my eyes to an outsider's view. Yeah, we talk about being so dang happy in the LDS church. But the impression that we give to other people is that we're really quite sad about the whole experience. Yeah, I'm with you. I think the mirage is that when you go to church, everybody dressed up, everybody puts their best face on. And so you have all these problems in your home and you look out across the congregation and you assume like, oh yeah, the, the Johnsons, man, they're doing it right. Oh yeah, look at the Look at the Fields family. They're, they're just kicking booty over there. Look at, oh, look at the Smiths. They're just uh, knocking it out of the park. And the reality is, having served as a bishop and having sat down with all of those families, is that every one of them has the same kinds of problems and sometimes even greater dysfunction in their home than the average family outside the church. So I, I just, I think being a human is being a human. And we've got to stop seeing... Uh, an insider's view, and again, it's not easy. You're right, RFM. Like as an insider, you see things a certain way, but for the listener who's a believing member, the more often you can step outside your own shoes and either change the language so that what's being talked about is another system or put yourself outside your system and look at it from an outsider. Uh, and I think anytime you do that, it actually helps you uh, to have a more full and more well-rounded perspective. As one wise man once said, church is a place we go to on Sundays to pretend we're perfect. You got it, my friend. That's exactly because it's supposed to be a hospital for the sick. And we often treat it like the sick aren't welcome and the hospital is for the perfect. And everybody shows up pretending, but nobody really is. Um, anyway, I'm ready to move on to the, the next section if you are. Let's go. Play the tape. So would you seek financial advice from someone who is broke and in debt? Would you ask for medical advice from a charlatan snake oil salesman? Who would you take some advice from on your 
on how to improve your forehand in tennis? A weekend hack or Roger Federer? So why would you entrust your eternal welfare to those who are spiritually bankrupt because they have ripped up in doubt what they once planted in faith or who, as Jeremiah said, have forsaken Christ, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. These individuals have walked away from that fountain of living waters and want you to trust in something that doesn't hold water. This is one of the many quotes from this talk where they refer to people who have left the church as being people who are spiritually bankrupt. They talk about, would you ask for financial advice for someone who's broke and bankrupt? Would you ask for medical advice from a charlatan snake oil salesman? Mmm, that starts striking too close to home if you know anything about Joseph Smith's early history. I was triggered. Regarding... Yeah, really? I was triggered. That, that, yeah, absolutely. Yes, and of course, everybody, I think, who listens to this podcast knows we're not talking about being a snake oil salesman, but other questionable practices in which Joseph Smith engaged, which could have definitely been viewed by an objective observer as charlatan... Oh, shit, I don't even know what the... Okay, as being a charlatan... <laughs> hang on, let me see here. I don't know what... The, charlatanery? <laughs> hang on. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I ran right into that wall. Um could definitely be viewed by an objective observer as along the lines of a charlatan with charging money for looking into a hat with a seer stone in it to find buried treasure. And then this whole idea then about would you seek for, uh, what was it, tennis, advice on your tennis backhand uh, from, what was it, from somebody who doesn't know anything about tennis or from Roger Federer? Roger Federer. Oh my gosh, I don't even know who Roger Federer is. You know, that, that shows how interested I am in tennis. I can take it from the context that this is some big name in tennis. Did you know who that was, Bill, when she said it? I've heard the name, but I haven't watched tennis since John McEnroe. Me too. At least he was worth <laughs> watching throw in his racket and <laughs> everything like that. Screaming he, at the refs, almost punching people. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. But here's the thing. The thing is this. First off, painting people who leave the church and are critical of it as being the absolute worst people in the world to take advice from. Now, the fact of the matter is that most people who end up leaving the church do so because they've studied the church and they know more about the church than the people who don't leave the church. Would you accept that as a general proposition? Absolutely. That's, that seems to be the case. My experience is that people who step away have investigated Mormonism, its claims, its history, its context much more deeply than those who are, are still in fully believing. Right. And so that's my experience, too. I mean, Dan Vogel used to be an active member of the church. He went on a mission, and yet he has studied and ends up being probably one of the most preeminent scholars on Joseph Smith, if not the preeminent scholar on Joseph Smith in the entire world. So he knows his stuff better than anybody else knows about Joseph Smith, yet he leaves the church, and therefore all of his knowledge becomes meaningless to the Renlands. He becomes bankrupt. And so you shouldn't listen to this guy who knows more about Joseph Smith than anybody in the world because he left the church. Instead, you should listen to Elder Renland, who knows next to nothing about Joseph Smith compared to Dan Vogel, simply because Elder Renland is still in the church. Yeah, this, this idea of asking financial advice from someone who's bankrupt, again, that is belittling, diminishing. It's unhealthy rhetoric towards the person who stepped away. You don't know what their life looks like. You're free to ask them, let them tell their own story. The snake oil salesman was triggering because uh, when I look at Mormonism and at times when I look at leaders and the things they say and the tricks they play to make an illogical argument sound convincing enough to keep the believers believing, uh, it feels often like a snake oil salesman. And, and if we're honest, if we understand the history of that profession, these guys who get on these uh, little carts and ride them from town to town selling, uh, you know, miracle potions and cures for every disease and ailment that plagues a person, these guys made money. The, the reason they did this was because they could make money off of it. The, the medicines, the testimonies of those who used them, it sounded convincing. So the people who 
believed that what they were buying was going to work. Those people existed. They were there. And so to simply say like, oh, well, but, but we're different. We're Mormons and we have a real testimony. And, and you know, the Baptists and the Methodists, their testimonies aren't real. And anybody who left the church and finds some other path of spirituality, they're spiritually bankrupt. But, but our spirituality is real and, and those guys aren't. Like, again, it's an insider view and it just doesn't represent humanity. Um, anybody outside the church would just like laugh at that. And also would be offended by that because it's just nonsense. I agree. And the other side of this coin. Oh, by the way, I would have to add that um, uh, those snake oil potions that you talked about that were sold to heal people are probably just about as effective as Mormon priesthood blessings. Maybe even more so. Maybe even more so. But, you know, you get into this whole idea of the other side of the coin, as I mentioned before, is not only the people who leave the church, you'd never take advice from them. But it is the leaders. This is once again a way of indirectly elevating and aggrandizing themselves, especially Elder Rinlan, because now Elder Rinlan is the guy who you should go to for financial advice in a spiritual sense. He's the guy you should go to for medical help. And he's the guy who is Roger Federer of the Mormon church. He is the expert. He is the one. The leaders of the church are the ones you have to listen to about Religion. They are the ones who are the absolute experts on everything simply because of their position. And the irony of that will become greater when we get to the end of this very segment when Elder Rindland quotes from Jeremiah. And he talks about uh, the cistern of living waters. And he quotes Jeremiah as talking about Christ is the cistern of living waters. Well, the problem is that once again, he's paraphrasing like he paraphrased Elder Widso before. He's paraphrasing Jeremiah, but he doesn't tell you he's paraphrasing Jeremiah. Instead, he just paraphrases him and throws Christ in to the quote. Christ is nowhere in the quote from Jeremiah, but because he has made the association of living waters already in his mind from the New Testament with Christ. Now he's going to throw Christ in as if Jeremiah is saying that Christ is the fountain of living waters. So here you've got Ron Federer flubbing up his backhand in front of everybody after just proclaiming himself indirectly to be the pro and expert in all things tennis. Yeah. And before we get to the next quote, I just want to say, imagine paying Roger Federer for tennis lessons. You want to improve your backhand. You want to improve your forehand. You want to improve your stance and you want to improve your approach to where you go on the court to strike a ball uh, at the best angle. And what Roger Federer tells you is that none of that matters. None of that matters. What really matters is we're going to sit here. You're going to pay me a couple hundred bucks an hour and we're going to sit here and discuss how tennis is the greatest sport on earth. Uh, and that conversation is what ensues. And that's what LDS leaders do. He's proposing to be the expert, but he refuses to answer any of the questions and simply tells you to draw on your spiritual experience, your testimony of tennis per se. And, and that should be sufficient enough for you to be a good tennis player. The reality is at some point, the truth matters, the facts matter, the data matters, and that data points us back to our testimony and imposes that we reinterpret it and redefine it. You know, that is a really good point. It reminds me of the, the music man, the musical where once again, here's a snake oil salesman coming into town in order to sell the boys band, right? He doesn't know anything about music. Harold Hill doesn't know anything, but he's a spellbinder. And what he does, remember what he does is he tells all the boys in the band. He sells them the instruments and he tells them, here's how you do it. Here's how you play music. It's the think system. Think the minuet in G. And that's all he tells them. And of course, that doesn't really do anything. It's just a gimmick. But isn't that really similar to what Elder Renlin is doing is saying, I know everything there is to know about Mormonism. I know everything there is to know about music in the analogy. But all I'm going to do is tell you, I'm not going to tell you about the notes. I'm not going to tell you about all the different things that you have to know in order to actually read and play music. I'm just going to tell you the think system. Just think that you know how to play music and that will take care of itself. It's all you need. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I've got to put in this one other funny story that it reminds me of. Hopefully you'll find it funny too. This was an old Steve Martin routine from way back in the 1970s. And it's just a small bit he did when he talked about that someday when he had a kid, he thought it would be fun to teach the kid the wrong words for everything. 
so that when the kid grew up and went to his first day of school and raised his hand, the teacher would say, yes, Jimmy, what is it? And Jimmy would say, can I move dog face to the banana patch? <laughs> because, because, because the church isn't, it's not only just the think system, right? That they're telling you, just think that you know it. That's part of it. But they are also busy teaching you the wrong history of the LDS church. They know what the right words are. They know what the right history is, but they want to avoid that and teach you the wrong history. And then when you go to school and you get out there in the world, you sound just like Jimmy because you're so uneducated. You think you know things the way they are, right? Because that's the way you've been taught because you have faith in your leaders. You don't doubt them. You don't doubt that they're telling you the truth. You have faith in them that they are telling you the truth about the way things really happened. You get out in the world or you start doing additional research and you feel like the kid on the first day of school saying, can I move dog face to the banana patch? And you are out of your element. Absolutely. You've got to start relearning from ground zero. But the one thing you've learned, and maybe it's the most important thing that you've learned, is that your faith in the leaders of the church to tell you the truth was misplaced. And you don't know that you sound like an idiot until you've been placed outside of your system and suddenly realize that uh, things don't work the way I thought they did. Exactly. And uh, by the way, the final irony, I'm sorry, in what Elder Renlund says, he's talking about critics of the church and saying that their theories, their position doesn't hold water. Well, I call that bold talk for a one-eyed fat man. How can he sit there as an apostle of the LDS church with all the problems in the church and all the problems that he apparently knows something about but doesn't want to talk about? God help us that he should actually address any of the real issues in a factual way. No, he is going to tell us that the LDS church is the only system of belief that holds water and that anybody else who criticizes it, based, by the way, on the facts, and on the real history, the history he doesn't want you to know. No, they're the people whose system of belief does not hold water. Brothers and sisters, you can know that there is a living Christ. The blogosphere cannot replace scripture study and reading the words of living apostles and prophets. Foster your faith by going to trustworthy sources to find answers to your question. When we try to determine whether something is true or not, the prophet Mormon gives us a pattern to follow. Wherefore, all things which are good cometh of God, and that which is evil cometh of the devil. But behold, that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. It is given unto you to know and to judge that ye may know good from evil. And the way to judge is as plain, that ye may know with a perfect knowledge as the daylight is from the dark night. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you a way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore you may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. But whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. So it's simple. If a choice leads you to do good and believe in Christ, it's from God. If the choice entices you to do evil and deny Christ, it's of the devil. As you get on the covenant path, you can know that those things that distract you from that path, that persuade you not to believe in Christ, are wrong. Those things that persuade you to believe in God, to love Him, and to keep His commandments, are from God. You will miss spiritually important events if you choose persistent doubt fueled by answers from faithless and unfaithful sources. Returning to our parable, those who choose to stay on the well-used dented boat with the chipped paint and those who recognize that the boat saved them from drowning and can get them safe are those they'll save them and get them safely to shore. 
In other words, they get on the covenant path and stay on the covenant path. Then, as they endure to the end, the promise of eternal life is extended. This is the greatest gift that God can give. It's through this process that we come to know Jesus Christ, to know of his living reality, and to know of his love and compassion. The Doctrine and Covenant says, to some, it's given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. To others, it's given to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithfully. Notice that the reward is the same whether you know or believe eternal life to the faithful. All right, so Elder Renlund and Sister Renlund kind of tag team here. And, and a couple of things they're trying to get across. There's this idea of Jesus with Peter on the water. We ought to recognize that in the original story, in the scriptures, it's Christ himself who calls Peter out of the boat. Uh, there's this idea that choice uh, leads to good or it leads to evil, and that's the way to judge. There's the idea that another way to judge is whether uh, something leads us to believe in Christ or to disbelieve in Christ. But what if something calls us to... Uh, do good and to uh, utilize the teachings of Christ more fully, but to disbelieve in him historically, for instance. Like, life isn't binary. Not all things lead to believing in Christ and also lead to doing good. Not all things are either evil and disbelieving Christ. Um, there, it's just, we don't live in that kind of a world. So I, I don't like when somebody says like, it leads you to do good. It leads you to do bad. Uh, because sometimes it feels like the church is saying that the ends justify the means. And so if the end is good, then do whatever you can do to get there. Like, I, I don't want to do that. I think sometimes that is not as, uh, as cut and dry. Um, the other thing too, is sister Renland here in the end admits once again, that the uh, boat itself is a dilapidated, as you put it, RFM, it's a dilapidated dinghy. Uh, she says this boat that is just worn and tattered, and, and we ought to acknowledge, like, they're essentially saying this is a boat that's in bad shape, and it's getting worse by the moment. But there's the realization that, hey, but it does have the saving ordinances. And so nothing else matters here. The concept is almost like, it doesn't matter what problem exists. It doesn't matter if we've done a thousand things wrong. It doesn't matter if our scriptures really are historical or not. It doesn't really matter if the truth claims we have are founded on actual historical events that actually occurred the way we told you they did. But what does matter is we have saving ordinances. We have the covenant path. And so how bad a shape this boat is in, how much worse it's getting by the moment, whether this thing's taking on water or not, none of it matters. It provides you the covenants. And that sometimes feels like a dismissal because it ignores the uh, vulnerability needed to have the conversation about the condition of the boat. Oh, absolutely. And this kind of argument is exactly when I joined the church back 40 years ago, when I joined the church, this is the exact kind of argument that we used to make fun of the Catholic church for making. Then it was a sign of the apostasy that the Catholic Church could say, hey, it doesn't make any difference what we've done in our history. We have a direct line of succession back to Peter with the priesthood. And now the LDS Church is making the same kind of argument. It doesn't make any difference what's happened, what's gone on, what the leaders have done, how they contradict each other. None of that matters because we have a direct line of priesthood back to Peter, James, and John, exactly like the Catholic Church I once had a friend who said something that this reminds me of, which is the only difference between the Mormon church and the Catholic church is 2,000 years. Yeah, I think that's very true, especially in the last decade. It seems as though everything Mormonism is criticized about Catholicism that says like, look, there was an apostasy and we were needed. And here's all the signs of all of that. It seems like in today's Mormonism, we're actually doing the very things we were criticizing. Right, and I have speculated that that may be one of the reasons that we are not hearing much about the apostasy anymore in general conference, unlike when I was young and we heard about it every single time. It was a constant theme, the, the apostasy and the restoration through Joseph Smith. Another thing that's said here is about 
The things that we need to focus on are not unreliable sources. We know we need to go to trustworthy sources are the words that they use. And those trustworthy sources are scripture study and the words of the living prophets. Well, really, scripture study is not important in that phrase. It's said out of a sense of duty. Scripture study and the words of the living prophets. It's the words of the living prophets that is important in that sentence. And the reason I say that is because in the LDS view of things, the living prophets tell us how to interpret the scriptures as well. They tell us what the correct interpretation of the scriptures is. If we were to come up with an interpretation of the scriptures that was in variance to what the words of the living prophets were, it is the words of the living prophets that would trump in that situation. So really what she's saying is the trustworthy sources are the living prophets, i.e. my husband, the anointed seer. Remember this guy standing to my right, the big good looking guy, the living prophets. That's what we have to go to. Those are the only trustworthy sources. And unfortunately, as I have documented on many, many episodes in Radio Free Mormon, and as you have touched on many, many times, Bill, and as is becoming more and more evident to more and more Latter-day Saints, the leaders of the church, the words of the living prophets, are not trustworthy. They are not something that we can trust just because they say them. We find more and more that the things that they say do not match reality and in fact, very often are misleading in what they try Another to say. Another angle to this, it's, it's the same thing one degree off, which is the trustworthy source is the living prophets. So why not read the words of the dead prophets? Um, so we have scripture study, which includes the words of dead prophets in biblical times. But the church seems to make this strong uh, distinction between the living prophets today being a trustworthy source and the past prophets of this dispensation who are dead, we ought to be a little more careful of. And I think there's a reason. In other words, if the average believer starts diving into what past prophets have said, they're going to find that current prophets contradict very strongly what past prophets have taught. So now you have living prophets as a trustworthy source, but the moment President Nelson dies, he becomes a past prophet, not a living prophet. And at some point, a living prophet is going to contradict and change the very things that President Nelson said were revelation and were uh, adjustment we were making for the last days before Jesus gets here. And now we're going to adjust it again and, and contradict what that was. And then you have the teachings that get contradicted. So you have, uh, for instance, those of color not able to receive the priesthood. And there is so much problematic data in that issue that the church doesn't want you going back and reading George Albert Smith's prophetic statements on race. The church would like you to stay away from that. It's not a trustworthy source. Instead, focus on what Elder Oak said in the B1 celebration, because that's a living prophet. Ignore what Joseph Fielding Smith said on the age of the earth, or what Joseph Fielding Smith said on Cain being Bigfoot. That's a past prophet. Let's stay in the living prophets. But the moment you realize that all living prophets become dead prophets and they're going to be contradicted by future living prophets, you realize like this thing becomes a mess pretty quickly. Yes. And as soon as you realize that, and by the way, an even more seemingly innocuous kind of example, but nonetheless very real, has to do with President Nelson and his emphasis now on not calling the Mormon church the Mormon church, right? Hashtag victory for Satan. We know that the past two prophets, we don't even have to go back to Joseph Smith or Joseph Fielding Smith or the scriptures or anywhere. All we have to do is go back to Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson and the fact that they promoted the use of the word Mormon in the Meet the Mormons movie under President Monson and also on the I'm a Mormon campaign, the advertising campaign with President Hinckley. This is directly contradicted now by President Nelson, who, if we actually believe what he says, God has revealed to him that Mormon, using the word Mormon, is a victory for Satan, which means that the prior two prophets, President Hinckley and President Monson, were all about giving victories for Satan by promoting the name Mormon. Now, this is an interesting example, I think, because it is so close in time and pretty much everybody has lived through that advertising campaign and that movie, Meet the Mormons. And now all of a sudden we're running head into a man who's always had a 
oh, let's call it a theological hobby horse, to use an expression from Bruce R. McConkie. He's always had this hobby horse about using the full name of the church and not contracting it to the Mormon church, which we know because he gave a talk on it back in 1990, that he still thought it was important then. But now he gets promoted, finally, by the process of the people ahead of him passing away. Now he's the president of the church, President Nelson is. Now he can take his hobby horse. Now he can make it official doctrine. Now he is the president and prophet of the Lord's church. And so what he says now is a trustworthy source simply because of the fact that he is the president of the church and even though his being a trustworthy source automatically makes the past two presidents and prophets untrustworthy sources yeah 1990 gordon b hinckley october conference i suppose that regardless of our efforts we may never convert the world to the general use of the full correct name of the church because of the shortness of the word mormon and the ease with which it is spoken and written they will continue to call us Mormons, the Mormon church, and so forth. Then he says, they could do worse, right? Like, it's not that bad that we're being called Mormon. Now, here's a prophet, seer, revelator. President Nelson comes along and says, no, 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 no. It's a victory for Satan. It offends God, even though Elder Bednar says that being offended is a choice. So now God has chosen to be offended. And again, the idea of offending God contradicting Elder Bednar, the idea of a victory for Satan contradicting President Hinckley, who said we could do worse, Again, living prophets are trustworthy only because they can't be disavowed in the present. Past prophets are not trustworthy because future prophets will disavow them. Right. And historically speaking, we don't need to get into this huge tangent, of course, but President Nelson gives, excuse me, Elder Nelson at the time in April conference of 1990 gives his talk about why we should use the full name of the church. In October, the next conference of 1919, 1990, President Hinckley gets up. He actually talks about President Nelson's prior talk and commends it, but then subverts it by saying, you know, we could do worse and we, maybe we could just make the word Mormon shine with added luster. So it's within this historical context. The Mormon church presents as being built on the bedrock of revelation, on the bedrock of doctrine that does not change. And yet here's a classic example of it changing even within our own lifetime. And yet what is the direction that we are supposed to do? Which are we supposed to believe? Well, that's easy because we believe in the living prophet, not those dead prophets. It was okay to believe in them while they were alive, but now that they're dead and we have somebody who says something different, our allegiance shifts, the doctrine goes 180 degrees different, and that is now what we are supposed to believe. It is anything but a solid construct. It is ever-changing. Meanwhile, living prophets and dead prophets contradicting themselves left and right. Right, and it wouldn't have been such a bad thing if President Nelson had just said, you know, I would prefer that we use this term, uh, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and not use Mormon, because I think that would be appropriate, that would be respectful. But no, he has to go whole hog, because he's getting revelation like hell isn't having any, and now God has told him that anytime the word Mormon is used, it's a victory for Satan, and God is offended. Well, now he's just really blown up the entire bus, and he has thrown President Monson and President Hinckley under the wheels, but that's okay. Pay no attention to that. There's nothing to see here, folks. Just focus on what the guy who's living and at the head of the church right now today says. Forget all that stuff from just a few years ago, and you will be okay. You'll stay in the boat, and you won't have any problems. President Nelson, I'm offended that you're offended. So the ball's in your court, chief. <laughs> Are you ready to play on? Because now, now Elder Renlund tells a story about his dad. This is the actually the only time in the entire presentation where Elder Renlund becomes a human being. Up to this point, he and his wife both have their masks firmly in place. They're more automatons. They're more like something you'd see in the Hall of the Presidents at Disneyland than real human beings. But all of a sudden now, Something significant happens and Elder Renlund will take off the mask and he will be a human being and talk about a real human situation. And this is the part that really grabbed me in the talk because of that. Go ahead and play the tape, Bill. In April 2009, I was sustained as a general authority in the church. In October 2009, I was asked to speak at general conference. I was anxious that my father would be able to listen to conference. He had worked hard as a carpenter and builder his entire life, and at age 92, had severe issues with his back. He was unable to come to the conference center, so one of my sisters made sure that he could watch the session on TV at his home in Salt Lake City. 
After the conference, I went to his home to see what he thought of my talk. He was a man of very few words and not liberal with compliments. I said, Dad, did you see conference? He said, yaw. I said, Dad, did you hear my talk? He said, yaw. I said, well, Dad, what'd you think? And he said, oh, it was all right. I was almost proud. (laughs) But then I learned that he was distracted that evening because he desperately wanted to share with me a dream he'd had the night before. He wasn't a dreamer. He never had fanciful thoughts. I never knew him to tell a lie. He had always been brutally and tactlessly honest. He said, I dreamed that I died and saw the Savior Jesus Christ. He took me in his arms and said that my sins were forgiven. And Dale, it felt so good. That was all he said. And I was constrained from asking anything further. He died two months later when Ruth and I were in Madagascar. My dad, after joining the church in Larsmo, Finland, at age 24, lived his life in accordance with the light and knowledge he'd received. He did all that he was ever asked to do. He became one who qualified for that gift of the Spirit to know that Jesus is the Christ and was crucified for the sins of the world and for his sins. Qualifying for this gift is not gender-dependent and it's not priesthood office-dependent. It's the promised reward for choosing faith and choosing the covenant path. The, the first thing, RFM, as I, I sit and listen to the story, is his dad. Um, his dad answers his questions, yah, yah. Uh, but then he says, he says when, when Elder Runland gives his very first like conference talk, he comes home and says, Dad, how did I do? And Dad's words were, I was almost proud. And the crowd gives this laugh. And, and I get he's telling a personal story. And, and I get that he created this as a laughing moment. And it works. But I would have sat in the crowd and I would not have laughed. Because to me, what I see here, because I'm not a perfect dad. Um, as a father, I am a hit or miss. I'm never going to get the dad of the year award. I'm not going to be the worst dad in the world. I'm not going to be the best. I'm probably somewhere around the middle. But what I would never do to my children when they have these highlight moments in their life is for them to come say, dad, how did I do? And me to go, I was almost proud. Like if any of you just sit with that for a minute, I know Elder Runlin wants to paint, paint his dad as a good father. But the reality here for me is that one statement alone tells me his dad was a piece of shit. Ouch. Wow, that's pretty strong, Bill. Yeah, but, but RFM, have you ever told your children in their highlight moments that you were almost proud? Well, no, no, I haven't. But then again, I'm not Swedish. No, seriously, though. Seriously, though. This reminds me, do you remember the home front series of commercials that the Mormon church ran back in the late 60s and early 70s? They'd be on TV. And they were just like little 30 second things about how, you know, not to be a crappy parent. And the one I remember is this little kid running home from school and he runs in the front door and he's yelling up the stairs at his dad, who's probably up there watching, I don't know, some kind of ball game. He says, dad, dad, I got all A's on my report card. And the dad says, don't slam the door when you come inside. And the kid goes, oh, and looks down and kind of trudges away. And then there's some kind of clip at the end about don't be a crappy dad brought to you by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But that's exactly the kind of thing that's going on here. But you see, to me, I realize that his dad has deficiencies. It's obvious to me that Elder Rinlin realizes it, too, even though he tells this story. But that's what's real about it, you see. And that's what attracts me is that there is a reality. I don't believe half of what... Elder Renlin is told about the story about the mythical Stephen and all the questions he had. I don't believe half of that. That's a construct. This story is real and it really happened. And that's what grabbed me. And it was so interesting that all of a sudden Elder Renlin, when he's saying, Dad, what did you think about the story? Now he's a real person. He's not just reading the teleprompter. He is reliving that moment. He is there in the present and he is connecting with me 
as a human being. But he says, Dad, what did you think? And he goes, yeah, I was almost proud. And all of a sudden, my heart reaches out to Elder Renland because a father at 92 years old who says this to a son who's just spoken in general conference isn't doing this for the first time in his life. This is a pattern that has been going on for his entire life as a father and whether he learned it from his dad or whether it's a false or perhaps misplaced sense of modesty and doesn't want to be prideful about anything including what his kid does I don't know all I know is the impression I got is all of a sudden I see Elder Renlin as a kid growing up with his father and working so hard and desperately to try and win his father's approval but never getting it even when Elder Renlin has grown up. He's a general authority. He's speaking at general conference. His dad is a lifelong member. His dad is TBM. This should be finally, finally, I've done something that you can approve of me for, dad. What did you think? Did you see me? What did you think? And he has to, he has to pull the answer out of his dad, like pulling teeth. And finally, the answer he gets is, I was almost proud of you. So that's the first thing that I see in it, Bill. Did you have any comments about that? Yeah, you I think you hit it, which which is here is a pattern in the in his life where he has tried to get validation from his dad and his dad would think about this. If you're Mormon for your child to become a general authority and to give a sermon or to preach or to give a talk in general conference is is the highlight as a parent of a child in Mormonism, right? Like, like if you're a believer to have your kid become one of the top leaders in the church and to give a talk in general conference, I, I can't imagine as a believer being more proud of my child. And for him to say, I was almost proud at this moment that he should have been as proud as he's ever been tells you that this father has never given elder Runland validation. And then later on, uh, Elder Renlund says, my dad was brutally, and, and if I'm not mistaken, does he say brutally honest? Yes, I think he does. And something about uh, tactless. Yeah. So brutally honest. In other words, when he says, I was almost proud, Elder Renlund, his self-esteem deeply relies on his father's validation and his father's truth is also Elder Runlin's truth. In other words, when I say my father told me I was he was almost proud of me and my father is brutally honest, what I'm also telling the crowd is that my father's story is the only story I'm able to believe about myself. And so deep down inside Elder Runlin is a, a little 10-year-old who has never gotten validation for, for his achievements, for the things he's accomplished, Because his dad, he believes his dad to be brutally honest, and he believes his dad has never been proud of him. Right. I agree with that. Now, I also do want to say that I'm not trying to psychoanalyze Elder Renland here. And what I I think is going on, I think it probably has some validity. I'm not here to say it's the absolute God's honest truth, and this is the way he was raised, and this is why he behaves the way he does. All I'm trying to say is that the telling of the story made Elder Renlund accessible to me as one human being to another. And that was why I thought it was an important point in the story. And it was the part at which he was authentic. The one part of the entire talk in which he was authentic, at least that was my perception. But immediately after having already said that his dad told him this, and obviously how somewhat crushing that would be, and it's a laugh line, but yeah, I think we all get it's a bit painful, he immediately now shifts from being authentic to being inauthentic. Okay, he goes back to the mask role. He goes back to faking it. And what I mean by this is he seeks to give cover for his dad. He seeks to uh, make it understandable and even okay that his dad said that to his son. I was almost proud because he goes on and says, well, he was, I found out later that my dad was distracted. You remember when he said that, Bill? Yeah, and I agree with you that he's taking what he perceives maybe as his dad's worst moment of not living up to what the expectation was. Like, here's this golden chance to just say, son, you hit it out of the park. I was so proud of you. And he takes this, this like the worst moment 
and then turns it on its head and says like, ah, look guys, see, he did that horrible thing, but it's not so bad. Let me, let me make it sound positive. Um, I think there's, and again, maybe I am psychoanalyzing and I'm okay with that. I, I think there's a lot going on here inside Elder Runland for why he would even tell that story and then tell it in a way that allows the crowd to laugh and to kind of paint it as not so bad. It's almost as if he needed it to not be so bad. I think that's true. And I think, once again, the psychoanalyzer in me coming out, uh, I think that he probably has a long history of making excuses, either within himself or to other people, about why his dad acts the way he does toward him. But having said that, he says... I found out later that my dad was distracted. Okay, so he was distracted, and that's why he said this thing that was kind of mean and rude to me. But the thing that he was distracted by really is the point of the story that he is laboring toward, which is this dream that his dad tells him that he had the night before. So his dad's 92 years old. He's had, I don't know how many dreams in his life, probably thousands of dreams. But He's getting toward the end of his life, and he has a dream that he sees Jesus and that Jesus embraces him and tells him that your sins are forgiven you, okay? Now, the first thing I want to say about this dream is that typically, here's where I, here's where I think that Elder Renlund starts fudging things. Typically, a person who has had a dream like that, that Jesus has held them and forgiven them of their sins, and this is a very meaningful experience for him. He's going to be affected by that dream. His dad's going to be affected by that dream, not to be continuing to be rude to his son the next day when his son speaks in general conference. One would typically think that that would make him changed in his attitude toward his son and be much more loving and kind and generous in his comments to his son. It's kind of like Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas morning after he's had the encounter with the ghost, right? He's changed because he had these encounters. And now he is much nicer and kinder. Instead, Elder Renlund's dad appears to be unchanged by the experience. And yet, this is the experience that Elder Renlund is pointing to as to say, this is why my dad was distracted and why he was so rude. And so this is where it starts not making so much sense to me and where I start seeing him fudging. But the second point of this dream is that Elder Renlund is using this now. This is really the point of it. To say... Even though my dad's had thousands of dreams in his life, like anybody would, he finally has a dream that he sees Jesus and that Jesus embraces him and Jesus says, your sins are forgiving you. Now, obviously, this would be a meaningful dream to a person who is later on in life, who's faithful LDS, who believes in Jesus. So that would be significant. Yet, it is just a dream, Bill. I mean, once when I was in my early 20s, back from my mission, I dreamed that I had killed Michael Jackson and buried him by burying him alive, right? And I felt bad about that. Even waking, I remember that's why I remember the dream. I felt bad about it because here I I buried Michael Jackson alive. And what a horrible thing to do. But the fact that I had that dream didn't make it reality, obviously, because Michael Jackson continued to live and be very famous for some time after I'd buried him alive in my dream, Bill. But here's a dream about Jesus. And it's a nice dream, but notice what Elder Renlund does with it. He leverages that dream and he promotes that dream to be more than just a dream. He says that because of this dream that his dad had, after a lifetime of faithful service in the church, his dad was given the gift of the Spirit to know that Jesus is the Christ. So now this dream that his dad has becomes him actually seeing Jesus And now knowing that Jesus is the Christ, that's the first thing I have to say about it. What are your thoughts, Bill? Just, I think you're right. I think uh, we often in Mormonism play on the old men shall dream dreams and the young men shall see visions. There's this idea that if a dream is faith promoting, it becomes something that came from God. If the dream is just, you know, I'm in the forest and playing with bears, then that's just a dream. But I think if we're going to be honest, if we're going to be, even as believers, the the perspective I think most believers hold is like, yeah, most dreams are just dreams. And maybe once in a while, God's given us something. But I don't think we should attribute every dream that has some type of religiosity to it, uh, to being from God. Uh, but as you point out, Elder Renlund here is, uh, is adamant that, that he's going to do that with this one. Yes, and I think that if you take this story in context with the comments that will follow from his wife, that the idea is that 
you have faith by doing everything you're supposed to do within the Mormon church. You do everything you're supposed to do. You do your home teaching or ministering. You know, you attend your meetings. You do all the nine yards, the genealogy, going to the temple. You know the drill bill. You pay your tithing. And you do all these things, and you do that out of faith. And then at the very end of your life, if you're lucky, you'll get a dream about being hugged by Jesus and told that your sins are forgiven you. And then it will all be worthwhile. So that is what I see is going on here, and I think you'll hear it more in the comments that follow, that this is what it's aiming at, is that you show your faith by doing everything that you're supposed to do for your entire life, which, by the way, circles back to my interpretation of the original parable about the kid in the boat, and that the kid isn't going to be dropped off at shore in 12 miles. He's got to stay in the boat for the rest of his life and do everything that the ship's captain tells him to do. Uh, Do you have any comments on that before you wanted to continue with tape? No, let's do it. So how can we develop faith and keep it strong? Well, it takes some work. Have you ever been in a math class, let's say calculus, and watched the professor work a problem? Does his or her knowledge automatically transfer to you because you watched the professor find the answer? Sadly, no. To acquire the knowledge, the same knowledge the professor has, You need to work the calculus problems on your own. You need to study. Work all the practice problems until you are comfortable with the process, the equations, all the symbols. In a similar way, finding faith and strengthening faith takes work. We may be inspired by someone who has great faith, but another's faith is not transferable to us in the process. We must do our own studying from the scriptures, and the words of the living prophets. We must pray, really work communicating with Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. It's essential to worthily partake of the sacrament each week and remember how merciful God has been to each of us to give His Son to atone for our sins. These personal, private acts of devotion build and maintain faith. The first responsibility I had as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve was to go and tell the Church History Department that I'd be replacing Elder Jeffrey R. Holland as one of the advisors to their department. As you can imagine, there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth (laughs) as they learned that one of their beloved advisors would be replaced. An acute Kleenex shortage developed. As part of my assignment as an advisor to the Church History Department, I've read all the volumes of the Joseph Smith Papers. I've also read the first volume and the first portion of the second volume of the new narrative history of the Church entitled Saints. Reading everything Joseph Smith ever wrote or was reported to have said has simply strengthened my testimony of his role as a prophet chosen of God to restore his work on earth. Joseph Smith was always true to his testimony. He was consistent. He always behaved as one who had actually seen our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, Moroni, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John, Moses, Elias, and Elijah. He acted as one who had possessed the golden plates and translated those ancient texts by the gift and power of God. He acted as one who received revelation from Jesus Christ himself. He acted as one who had received priesthood authority and keys of the Holy Apostleship. I know in ways more powerful and reliable than what my five senses can detect and express that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw, translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God, and received the priesthood with its attendant keys for the salvation of mankind. I know this to be true. I know that those keys are on earth today and that President Nelson is Joseph Smith's rightful successor on earth. What we consider dense and peeling paint on the well-used boat may turn out to be divinely sanctioned and divinely directed from an eternal perspective. The Lord has either had a hand in the dents and the peeling paint, or He uses them for His purposes. I know of myself 
that the Lord Jesus Christ directs his work on the earth today. His servants today know him well. I am grateful to add my testimony that I know Jesus Christ is our Savior. When we exercise faith, not doubt, in his atoning sacrifice and the fruits of his atonement, our lives are eternally blessed. I am grateful he has restored his Church today with all of the blessings available to God's children on earth. Jesus Christ lives and is the Savior of the world. I testify of his compassion, love, and caring concern for all of God's children. I witness of his incomparable atoning sacrifice for you and for me. As I have come to know the Savior, I have learned of his great desire to help wounds heal and to mend broken hearts. I pray that God's richest blessings will be yours. I pray that you will develop faith in Jesus Christ, that you doubt not but be believing. I invite you to increase your faith in Christ by studying the scriptures and the words of living prophets, praying and communicating with Heavenly Father, and conscientiously preparing for and worthily partaking of the sacrament each week. God will bless you as you engage in these personal, private acts of devotion and serve and minister to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So the, the one thing that sticks out to me in all of that is uh, Sister Renlund, she talks about study, study the gospel, and, and talks about a classroom and a teacher and how, how information is disseminated from the teacher to the student, and it just can't be absorbed by osmosis, but, but that the student has to do the work, and they've got to gain the information. They have to do the research. They've got to take the notes. They've got to do their homework. Um, and, and all of that I agree with. But then what she does is she turns it on its head again, and she essentially says, like, here's the approved sources that you can do that with. And throughout this talk, we're told the things to stay away from. And it reminds me of this little meme that I've seen go up before. And it shows a picture of a stick figure. And it's a guy with uh, holding some, some papers in his hand. And he says, he says, of course, you're allowed to ask questions. Here is the list of approved questions you can ask. And then he says, you're absolutely free to study and investigate for yourself. Here is the list of approved sources. And then it finishes with him saying, we're not trying to stifle thought. We want you to learn everything you can as you reach the approved conclusions. So here's the questions you can ask. Here's the sources from which you can study. Here's the conclusions you're allowed to reach. And anything else is really bad. It's the work of the devil. You've been deceived. Um, you're, you're the tares. You're the, you're the chafe. You're fallen. You're apostate. You're broken. You want to sin. You're in sin. You're somehow less than unless you follow this formula of asking the right questions. Because anything that's not a right question is a doubt. Doubts are bad. Questions are good. But only the questions that lead to faith. In other words, the approved questions. Here's the list of sources you can study. Here's the approved conclusions. And that's not really study at all. Yeah, I really like that uh, that meme that you refer to. Also, she uses the example of you're in a calculus class. Well, that doesn't really comport with the Mormon experience as it's lived by members in the pews. You never get the calculus for crying out loud as a Mormon. You are stuck with basic arithmetic from cradle to grave, from birth to earth, from sperm to to worm. That's all you get. That's why it's so boring. You are actually prohibited and not encouraged from going beyond basic arithmetic and studying calculus. And if you do find that there is calculus, you're not supposed to tell it to the other members of the church for fear that they will start learning more than the basic arithmetic, which is all that they're supposed to know. So that's one of the reasons that I found her analogy a little bit off of the actuality of Mormonism. We, we never get into long division. Not even long division. We don't even carry the one. No, no. Nine divided by three, and that's as far as we're going to get today, kids. Absolutely. And I also like how uh, they talk about the personal private acts of devotion, which is what builds faith. Now, you remember I led into this by saying that they're going to talk about how you have to obey all the commandments, right? Well, they sort of don't do that because they say more than once, personal private acts of devotion are what build faith. But notice how they do this. It's very carefully done. They say that one of those personal private acts of devotion is worthily partaking 
of the sacrament. Well, what does it mean to worthily partake of the sacrament, Bill? It means that you are following all the commandments and doing everything you're supposed to do as a Mormon. Partaking of the sacrament may be a quote-unquote personal act of devotion, but to worthily partake of it incorporates a whole world of meaning into it, which means you've got to do everything that you're supposed to do in order to have these personal acts of devotion. Finally, he talks about the fact that he has read all of the Joseph Smith papers. Well, you know, that's certainly possible. He seems to be a literate fellow. I think that he is a reader. Elder Renland is. I think he's intelligent. And he may well have read all the Joseph Smith papers. But I notice that what he's doing by saying that is basically saying, look, I have read everything that Joseph Smith ever said, everything he's purported to have said. There's nothing to see here. It's all good. I am a witness that I've read it all. There's no problems there. So I can take that burden off of you. You don't have to read it yourself. You can just take my word for it. When, of course, there are other people who actually read the Joseph Smith papers and come to different conclusions and end up having questions and, dare I say it, doubts as well. This is, circles back to another theme that Elder Renlin mentioned before, which is about Stephen, the apocryphal figure Stephen in his talk, who is referred by Elder Renlin to experts. First, an expert on first vision account. Second, an expert on polygamy. That resolves Stephen's concerns, if you remember. Well, there's this idea, there's this message that's being promoted in and above the stories he's telling, which is that if you study church history enough, you don't have to do this because there are experts. There are experts who do this, and they are still members of the church, and they can explain it in such a way that it will resolve any doubts that any member has. But if you study enough, you will come to understand that there are no good reasons to have doubts. So once again, this theme coming forward that if you have problems with church history, not only are you being subject to the devil because you're doubting, but also it's your fault because you haven't studied enough. Yeah, no matter what, all roads lead to belief and any road that leads away from that is some kind of bad guy for, for having gone down that road. I, I, you know, you and I have talked about this before. I've said it, I think in the last two times we recorded, and I'm going to say it again. People may get tired of hearing it. What I would ask is if we're going to have a conversation with believers and progressive Mormons, Orthodox Mormons, as well as critics and people who are outside the church, uh, what I would say is if the church is not true, let's create a formula by which someone could discern that the church is not true. What the church does is it never offers that. Every possible formula leads to belief, and anything that would hamper belief is seen as not a productive way, not something that should be part of the formula, not one of the ingredients that should be involved. And so I think you hit the nail on the head again. Everything, everything is controlled in a way that every path leads to belief. Uh, there's no way in which someone can, in Mormon theology, Mormon rhetoric, Mormon articulation of these ideas, end up not believing. Right. And my final comment on this has to do with what Elder Renlin says about Joseph Smith, when he's bearing his testimony about Joseph Smith, because he sort of inadvertently condemns himself out of his own mouth. First off, he said that he's read everything that's in the Joseph Smith papers. Wait, do you, do you really believe that? Do you really believe he's read every page, every document? I mean, the Joseph Smith papers, they're, I don't know how many books there are at this point, a dozen of them. And they're, you know, 200 to 600 pages, whatever they are. Just, and they're all these documents and these uh, original handwriting. Do you think he's really read all that? Well, I will tell you, I'm certainly willing to take him at his word on this. He is the apostle who has taken Elder Holland's place as being the head over the church history department. So, I, you know, I don't see any reason to disbelieve that. Um, uh, you are a doubter, Bill. I am a believer. You are subject to Satan. I am not. Yeah, I've been carried away. Um, I know you were getting ready to say a thought there, but I'll just simply say I do doubt that. Like... I've read a ton and reading takes time and it takes energy and it takes a willingness to, to sit with something quietly. Uh, and when you're busy, when you're an apostle of the Lord and you've got a thousand other things to do, uh, including all the places you travel to and go to, and maybe, uh, but man, I, I, 
I'm not doubting that he's put his head in those books and read a bunch of it, but it's a serious claim when you say, I've read all of it. That's a lot. Yes, I hear what you're saying. I have read next to none of it. So I don't really know that much about it. I've read all sorts of things about Joseph Smith and what he said, what he's purported to have said, his sermons. But all of that study that I did was long before the Joseph Smith Papers Project was up and running on the internet. So we'll leave that as a bracketed claim of his for the present. But the point that I was trying to make was that he has read all the Joseph Smith Papers Project, certainly at least the first volume, which means that he is aware of the 1832 account of the first vision in which Joseph Smith mentions seeing only one person, Jesus Christ, not two people, Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. And therefore, since by his own claim, he has to be aware of that, it is notable that when he bears testimony of Joseph Smith, he says he bears testimony that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw. And when Elder Renlund said that, the first question I thought of was, well, which time, Elder Renlund, are you bearing testimony that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw when he said he saw Jesus and doesn't mention seeing Heavenly Father? Or are you more likely saying that He saw what he said he saw when he saw both of them in the official 1838 account, which is canonized in the Pearl of Great Price. And then I thought, well, wait a second, Elder Renlund, hang on. If you have read the Joseph Smith Papers Project, which would mean that you're familiar with the 1832 account of the first vision, and then you are simply saying, I bear testimony that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw when you are aware that he said he saw two different things, what are you doing When you are saying that, Elder Renlund, what you appear to be doing is to be glossing over the issue, whitewashing the history that you're aware of, and once again promoting the faithful version of LDS history, even though you know it is more complicated than that, and you know that there is evidence from Joseph Smith's own pen that contradict the official narrative. Yeah, there there are 18 volumes of the Joseph Smith Papers Project at this point. Uh, each of those books are quite thick. Uh, and I agree with you, RFM. You have, he has taken, essentially, and said, look, I've read it. Nothing, there's not a problem there. There's nothing to worry about. All is good and fine. But Sister Renlin just said that the student cannot get the information from the teacher through osmosis, that that person has to put their own study in. So there's a double message here. One is that, trust me, I'm the expert. Don't worry about any of this stuff. Stick to the correlated material. Don't go off into the weeds. And on the other hand, don't trust the teacher. Go learn it yourself because that's the only way to do it. Uh, you got to put the work in. But again, these are the trusted sources. Stay away from the untrusted sources in spite of the fact that the trusted sources are continually rewriting their narrative and the trusted sources contradict each other. Exactly. And that is the point. The fine point I was trying to put on this is that in the context of a talk in which they have already said that Elder Renland is the trustworthy source. He is the Roger Federer of tennis, right? In the context of saying that, at the very end of the talk, he is demonstrating that he cannot be trusted to tell us the full truth about church history, the full truth, which according to his own claim of having read the Joseph Smith Papers Project in its entirety, he is fully aware of. It's not a mistake. It is a calculated misrepresentation in order to sustain the dominant narrative. And with that, we have over the course of three episodes uh, deconstructed this talk by the Renlands. I hope everybody has enjoyed this, but I simply want to say, can you can you sense how much effort it takes to dive into a 30 minute talk and to take it apart piece by piece? Uh, again, I hope listeners are are enjoying it. My one suggestion is, I know RFM, you put a ton of work into these podcasts. I I know that a lot of effort goes into this on both sides here. I I will put a little plug in. I hope people will donate to the podcast. Uh, You and I, by the time we're done with these, I'm exhausted. I'm I'm worn and tattered, kind of like the dinghy that that the deaf captain and the young boy are in. Uh, My pain is peeling, and I've got dents in the side. Uh, I just hope that people will support the podcast, make a donation so we can keep doing this. And we'll keep doing this uh, as long as it's fruitful and worthwhile and, and advantageous to 
to both our lives as well as the lives of people listening.